Yeah, and it turned out it was phenomenal. I really appreciate all the work that uh, that a lot of the students in the club have done to help promote it, and uh, all of you who told your friends and neighbors about it. This is great, great. So, um, if you'd like to learn a little bit more about us and our club, uh, and community members are quite welcome. So we can have up to 49% uh, community members and 51% student members. So uh, we, we try to have regular meetings. Uh, we're trying to do something on a, about a weekly basis. Most of those probably just fun and game nights. But uh, we have some we have some uh, flyers up front. And uh, after the after the um, the talk, uh, we do have some copies of uh, Doug Van Curen's book for sale. Unfortunately, we we only have of uh, we don't have a cash box, so um, we're, we're going to be selling them for ten dollars, and uh, we can only accept exact change. But they are available, um, and if you don't have exact change, we can certainly give you information about how to get those at a later time. Um, our speaker tonight is Dr. James G. Corse from uh, Madison, Wisconsin. He is a professor emeritus uh, from the Department of Agronomy at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Uh, he's a member of the UW Plant Breeding and Genetics Program since 1983. And he's been, his teaching responsibilities have included courses in selection theory, quantitative and population genetics, evolutionary biology, and bioethics. Jim Corse received his doctorate in plant breeding and biometry at Cornell University. He developed and released novel corn germplasm as part of research as part of a research program that involves studies of long-term selection and the domestication of corn. Jim has served in a number of professional organizations, including the board of directors for the Crop Science Society of America, which he was the president of in 2005, and uh, as well as the American Society of Agronomy. Uh, he's a lifetime member and serves on the board of directors of the Freedom from Religion Foundation and. It's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Forrest. Well, it's a, it's a great pleasure to be here, and I really am grateful to the, uh, <coughs> the Secular Students Alliance for, for putting this together. Um, I guess I, I can't say anything more than uh, what the title says here. Uh, thank you, Charles Dylan, and happy 200th birthday. And, and I really am impressed by the, the, the poster out, outside this door, and I'll just read it as I quickly jotted it down. It's not the strongest of the species that survives, nor the most intelligent. It's the one that is the most adaptable to change. That's what I'm going to be talking about tonight, is the nature of adaptation. And uh, it's, it's really wonderful uh, how Darwin laid this out, and we're constantly sort of discovering and rediscovering the truth of what he said. And I really want to just kind of go over that, um, go over a little bit of history and um, spend some time on selection. This is a statement that Darwin made in a, a letter to a, a, a botanist friend of his, Hooker, uh, Joseph Hooker, about three years before he published The Origin, uh, The Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection. What a book a devil's chaplain might write on the clumsy, wasteful, blunderingly low, and horribly cruel works of nature. Uh, this quote is, is often cited by many, and the context of it is, is, is quite important to understand. Uh, uh, Hooker was a friend of his, and they, they wrote kind of uh, letters back and forth, and uh, many of them were sort of jocular and, and, and things like that. So. Um, some people actually misinterpret this. Darwin was actually um, very, very uh, sort of tormented by the fact that he was going to come out with the origin. <coughs> he was worried about it. There's no doubt about it. Um, and he did feel that perhaps he was going to be the devil's chaplain. And uh, people were going to be quite upset by how he described nature. And in fact, he actually had the theory of natural selection worked out about 20 years before he published the origin. Um, and knew that it was going to have a profound impact on the way people thought about things, and delayed publication primarily because he wanted to just get a whole heck of a lot of evidence in support of what he was going to say. And, and that's what Darwin was known for, he's a very methodical researcher. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a few preliminary comments about Darwin's time, the way people thought about things, 
spend a fair amount of time on natural artificial selection and give you a few examples just to make sure that we all know what this is and what the power of selection actually means. Talk a, a little bit briefly about what sort of the, the modern ideas about how organisms or genetic makeup is organized that provides such adaptability. Um, this is really sort of the whole new part of evolutionary development and, and, and is really quite fascinating. And then I'm going to return uh, back to this uh, with the actually go over the concluding uh, comments in, in the origins and reflect back on, on these comments over here. So what did people believe before Darwin? Um, and I'm talking really about the scientific establishment. People believe all sorts of crazy things before Darwin. Um, but really what the scientific establishment was pretty much set on, or at least for the most part, is that uh, species were pretty much fixed. There was no mechanism by which there was no, no observation, no consideration that species could transform in any fashion to any other sort of species. They didn't change. They were not transmutable. There were many, many centers of creation all over the world. Species came into existence sort of uh, hither and yon, and they disappeared hither and yon. And it, was, it was just like, um, you know, it was just kind of magic. Okay? Things just happened. They hung around for a while and disappeared. Um, and it was all under pretty much divine control. Furthermore, man stands outside of nature, or man stood outside of nature. Um, it was not part of the natural system, and, and uh, the mind and the consciousness of the human uh, consciousness was entirely spiritual. There was no connection to the natural world. That's a great simplification. But uh, we have to recognize that at this time, Mendelian genetics was way off in the future. Nobody had any idea about genetics. There was no mechanism for change. Um, so you can't really blame them for saying there was no, no means of change. They didn't know that there was a way things could change. Men Mendelian genetics didn't come about, and it didn't really firmly enter the scientific establishment until 1900, um, when uh, Mendel's work was rediscovered, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So, you know, this is somewhat understandable, but that's the way people thought at that point. Now, there were a couple of very influential people that came along and along just about at uh, Brown's time or a little bit before him. One was Thomas Malthus, and you've probably heard of, of him. He wrote an essay in 1798 on the principles of population. And what he meant there was really or what he observed were that populations tend to increase exponentially if they're not restricted in some fashion by resources. So address, Yet food production tended to increase linearly like this, and at some point things were going to get rough and everything was going to collapse. And that was Thomas Malthus. The other person who was very influential was a guy by the name of Charles Lyell, who was a geologist. And he came up with a, a concept which, which he called uniformitarianism. And all that means is the present is the key to the past. That what we observe now, when he's talking about geology, geological change, that what we see happening now in terms of earthquakes, volcanoes, rivers, and loading, landscape, things like that, is exactly what's been going on forever in the past. And more importantly, the pace of change that we see now is the same pace that's been occurring throughout geological history. The implication being, suddenly, people began to wear that Earth is incredibly old. People didn't really accept that, but that's what Lyle's geology implied. Okay? Um, there were a couple of other people around, but we'll, we'll come to them in a minute. Those were two pivotal influences on Darwin. Um, of course, he went on his, his trip on the Beagle. Uh, three years in the 30s, and then came around and he visited all regions of the world, and most regions of the world, and came up with something that he called natural selection. What I want to do is just talk about this a little bit. This, this is probably one of the most profound statements in, in all of science. And I'll read it. Now, Darwin is a little lengthy in the way he says things, so. so we're going to dissect this a little bit, but let me read this in a, in a way that hopefully makes it more clear. 
owing to the struggle for life, variations, however slight and from whatever cause proceeding, if they be in any degree profitable to the individuals of the species in their infinitely complex relations to other organic beings and to their physical conditions of life, will tend to the preservation of such individuals and will generally be inherited by the offspring. The offspring also will thus have a better chance of surviving for of the many individuals of any species which are periodically born, but a small number can survive. I have called this principle by which slight variation, if useful, is preserved by the term natural selection. There are really three things in this really the elements. Variation. The essence that drives this whole thing is, a, is the presence of variation within a population. The second is inherited. Darwin didn't really know what inherited meant. All he did, all he'd done is he sort of observed plant and animal breeders and could see that things were carried on in the future generations. So there was something that's being inherited. He didn't know how, but he saw that it actually happened. And this was actually almost a, a travesty in terms of what the clergy thought about this. Things didn't change like this, but he actually mentioned the word inherited. And then the thing that comes from, from Malthus is that a small number can survive. <clears throat> you add in, you add in uh, Thomas Malthus's, or not Thomas Malthus, but uh, Lyle's ancient age of the earth, and bingo, you have evolution, steady progress of, of life by means of evolution, by means of natural selection. I want to read a quote. Now, this is how I break it down, but I want to read a quote by Alan Orr, who's at the University of Rochester, um, about that statement of natural selection. Some ideas that are discovered late in the history of the scientific discipline, because they're subtle, complex, or otherwise difficult, natural selection was not one of these. Darwinism was revolutionary, not because it made arcane claims about biology, but because it suggested that nature's underlying logic might be surprisingly simple. And I think we all have a sense of that. The modern formulation of natural selection has three pieces. <coughs> In all species, more offspring are produced than possibly can survive and reproduce. That's observable. We all see it. <coughs> Anybody who looks sees that. Organisms differ in their ability to survive and reproduce in part owing to heritable factors. We know that's true as well. And in every generation, genotypes that promote survival in the current environment are present in excess at the reproductive age and thus contribute disproportionately to the offspring of the next generation. This is ironclad tight logic. This is about as ironclad and tight as you possibly can get. And anytime you get into an argument with somebody about the validity of evolution, I think you go to these three points, and you tell me which one of these is wrong. And if you do, you, you win the argument, because virtually you can't argue against any of these points. So as Orr said, we're dealing with a, a fairly simple overlay. Now, furthermore, we have to understand there's vast support for this in the scientific establishment. And, and in spite of what you know, we hear via the popular press and all the noise that organizations like the Discovery Institute uh, are, are coming for. Now, I don't really want to get into all the trouble that the Discovery Institute has caused over recent years. Uh, they've come up with really some strange ideas about differentiation between micro and macro evolution, irreducibly, the irreducible complexity and complex definition. Um, in honor of Darwin's birthday, I'm not going to go into any of these in any detail. I don't think there's any need to. I'm perfectly willing to entertain discussion about this later. Um, all I'm going to do is just point out the Discovery Institute, one of its founding documents, uh, it was called the Web Strategy, I'll quote from that, and this pretty much indicates that this is not a scientific endeavor that they're taking, undertaking. 
quote, uh, the purpose of, of what they're doing is to reverse the stifling dominance of the materialistic worldview and to replace it with a science consonant with Christian theistic convictions. This is not a statement of scientific intent. And if anybody doubts that, they should go to the, the trial transcripts of the Dover trial in 2005, just more versus Dover uh, uh, school board. Uh, John Jones, uh, Judge John Jones, was a conservative Republican federal judge appointed by George W. Bush. He wrote perhaps one of the most clear-cut uh, rulings uh, that established that, t uh, that the teaching of, of intelligent design in science courses at the Dover High School was firmly a violation, a violation of the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment of the Constitution. He did it in such a clear-cut and straightforward way that it makes textbook reading um, in terms of all the issues that come about from the Discovery Institute. And I'm really welcome to ask you if you're further if you're interested in this to go, to go through that. There's another great book called Monkey Girl by Ed Humes that, that also is sort of a more of a narrative approach of what was going on there. Um, just, we'll leave this by, by a quote from uh, Judge Jones that really we call the whole thing drunk taking away from the hand. Okay? And that's in the rule. I talked to him, I actually went and talked to him about this a year afterwards. And I said, You're really afraid to put a term like breathtaking away your name in the courtroom. <laughs> and he said, You should have seen what what I had in that ruling prior to what my wife <laughs> my wife looked at it and said, You gotta get rid of some of this. And so that was the remnants of what he had. <laughs> Um, it's really quite an interesting uh, era, and uh, as I say, I can talk to you about it later. If you like. The problem with these, the problem that these people from Discovery Institute and elsewhere is they don't like the idea that random events have anything to do with how uh, humans, in particular, but also all our, our natural organisms on this planet, advance through history. They don't like it. And we're going to deal with this in a minute. And I'll show you what I mean by that. I think we actually have to embrace randomness in many ways to actually understand the evolutionary mechanism, certainly in the way that, that Darwin did. I'll just, uh, to indicate this, this uh, fear of randomness, I'll, I'll just point out, this is straight off the website for the Center for Science and Culture, and this is uh, with, with a the organization that, that supports the intelligent design movement. Intelligent design holds that the universe and its living things are not simply the product of random chance. An intelligent cause is behind their existence. Intelligent design, excuse me, intel <laughs> intelligent design does not, it does run counter to the new school of Darwinism that holds random selection derives evolution. Chance mutations occur without reason. Intelligent design challenges this direction head on based on its belief that changes occur due to a reason. Okay? Now, chance events, what are they? Anybody who's taken a high school biology course, hopefully junior high, perhaps even earlier, know that all of the, the <coughs> uh, uh, properties of, of Mendelian genetics are, in many ways, random. In other words, you, each of your parents has two alleles for every gene, and you inherit one by chance from the father, and one by chance from the mother, and that makes you. And if you have 50,000 genes, in all likelihood, the combination of alleles that make you is so thoroughly unique that there's never been another copy of you genetically in the history of Europe. And that's a random process. Uh, the alignment of genes on chromosomes can shift. It shifts routinely. Different blocks of genes get associated with other ones. We call that recombination. That happens all the time. It's a routine part of the sexual cycle. That's a random process as well. And you throw in environmental fluctuations, which for all intents and uh, purposes are random as they relate to organisms trying to make their way through their life uh, is essentially random. All of these are random processes. So we got to deal with this, and Darwin did. 
what I'm going to do now, I'm going to shift gears a little bit, and I'm going to show you some selection examples. Because I think it's really important to know what selection means and all its little elements. It's a very simple process, but I want to show it to you. I want to show you the power of it. And I'm going to talk about something called the software of Melanogaster, which is the fruit fly. I'll talk in a minute why it was much maligned. Fruit fly research started by a person, uh, Thomas Hunt Morgan at Columbia around 1900. And the reason it started was because Mengel's rules of uh, genetics had just been rediscovered. People wondered, well, is all this stuff that's going on in peas generalizable, or is it just something that happens in peas? So Morgan decided, well, let's get a model organism going and see if we can test all this stuff in some other organism to see if it has any validity. And the fruit fly was the chosen organism because it has a a lot of variation. You can handle it in little vials. It's small. It has a short generation time, about two and a half weeks. So you can do lots of genetic experiments with it. Um, and in fact, Thomas Hunt Morgan won a Nobel Prize in 1930 using Prusakwa because he discovered that genes were placed on chromosomes. That that's where they reside. Okay? That's a pretty fundamental Finding. And you got to know about those things. Turned in more modern times, a candidate for a high office in the most recent election made this quote. Where does a lot of that earmark, <laughs> earmark money end up anyway? You've heard about some of these pet projects. They don't really make a whole lot of sense. And sometimes these dollars go to projects that have literally nothing to do with the public good. Things like fruit fly research in plants. <coughs> I kid you not. Most people know where this came from. Yeah. <laughs> I expect this audience might. Okay. Um, this is actually an insulting statement, and it should be an insulting statement. This is an act of active ignorance. And by active, I mean a willful anti intellectualism. And this, this sort of notion of active ignorance or anti-intellectualism is gained a foothold in this country and it's something we really have to fight. And I, I really appreciate everything that's being done in this room and by the people like you elsewhere to really address this head on because we really need to. Over the years, I counted six Nobel Prizes that had to do with three or the three five research. Okay. Um, one of the people up here, the guy way over on the side, that's uh, Theodosius Stokshansky. He didn't get a Nobel Prize, but he's the one who said nothing in biology makes sense except in light of evolution. <coughs> and he was working with fruit flies. Okay. Well, that's one reason I chose fruit flies, but it's also one of my favorite selection examples. I've got to set this up for you. Um, this is a long wind tunnel. And you put a bunch of fruit flies over on one end of it, and on the other end of it, you set up a light bulb and a fan that blows air into this wind tunnel. The intent of selection here is going to be to select flies that like to fly towards light and into the wind. Normally flies don't like to do either of those, not, not the particular strains that we were dealing with here. There is something called phototaxis that attracts flies, but they were not really part of this. The flies here didn't really like to fly into the light. Now what you can do is you set this up <coughs> And uh, you just start the experiment. And, and the first time around, the flies will kind of maybe wander down this a little bit. Actually, they probably won't wander as much as I showed here, but they'll wander a little bit. And uh, after a set amount of time, then you sit down and you close those chambers. And uh, you, you take the flies that advance the furthest, and you put them back together, let them mate, take the progeny, and then start again with those progeny from that intermating. You call that a cycle of selection. Okay. Then you do it again, and then you see the flies move a little further along. You trap the ones up ahead and uh, <coughs> intermate those selected ones. Just do it again, and next that's cycle two, and you do it again, and there's cycle three. And they did it for 300 cycles. And the, chain, the wind tunnel was 400 chambers long, 440 chambers long. They had to keep increasing the wind pressure 
to try to keep the, the, the flies from getting to the end or the experiment. Well, we map out the selection response in this. And uh, actually, this is the ability of, of, the, of the speed of flies to fly normally. They calculated the velocity and turn on the light and also the, the fan and, and measure the velocity of flies are uh, going. So they started out flying at about two centimeters a minute. And by the end of the 200, 300, uh, actually, it's back to two or 300 cycles, I can't remember what. They were flying at 200 <laughs> centimeters a minute. Okay, 100 fold increase. Uh, they didn't measure it here in the middle, but then there was pretty good selection response here. They had two different strains, so there's two different lines. Slowed down a little bit when they measured again after 200 cycles, but that's not a good selection. It was still advanced. advanced so I, this is a, I forgot to say this is done by Kenneth Miller at the University of South Southern Maine. <coughs> Now, what I like about this, now at the end of this, they said, well, they've been selected for the light, uh, attracting the light, and also uh, the ability to play with the fan. So there ought to be, are they independent? Can they just do both together, or can you actually set this up? So let's just set it up so that uh, they're flying just against the wind. They turn off the light, and oh, let's see, have it this way. Yes, they're, they're, and so they did just without the, the light, and they're just going against the wind, and the, and the flies took off and they went into the wind. Okay? And then they did the other way around, and then they had the controls, and the co controls just sat there. They didn't move. Okay? It's purely selective strength just by charging into the wind. They just controlled it. Um, and then what they did, and it, this shows how sadistic these guys are. <laughs> they turned off the fan and just left the light on. At the end of the tunnel. And the flies just went boom, smashing the wall. <laughs> <laughs> and it just it was mass collisions at the end of the tunnel. So it, the, the main message is yeah, they were selecting for both traits at once. They were somewhat independent, and they had flies that really liked to go on both into the wind and, and, and the light. And they had no propensity to do that at the beginning. So that's selection. That's what selection does. And it's simple as well. By the way, I guess I didn't really give you a number. There were, in these experiments, there weren't just a couple flies at the beginning. There were 40,000 flies at the beginning of each round. And they selected about 500. Okay. And the reason they did that was because they wanted to have a full suite of mutations and all the other genetic variability available for selection at the beginning. So they needed a huge population. So they made sure that they had all the uh, variation, genetic variation they needed to keep this thing going for 300 cycles. The second example I'd like to use is, is near and dear to me. This is something I was involved with. Uh, selection in corn for multiple years. Uh, a very simple idea started by my predecessor at, at the University of Wisconsin. Here's a normal corn plant. Kind of a simple idea, but simple ideas are often the most interesting things to take off on. If a normal corn plant produces one or two years, let's just go ahead and select and try to make it produce more years because then that means you have more green and you'll have higher yields per acre in the corn plant. A number of people were doing the same sort of thing. It's pretty easy to do. Uh, you just have to remember that corn plants have two, two parts of them. They have a male part, which is the tassel that produces the pollen, and the pollen contains the sperm. And then it's base of the silks on the ear shoots uh, is the egg. And so pollen flies all around the field and it lands on the silks and then grows down, fertilizes the egg, and that is the seed for the next generation. So that's the sexual biology of corn. So you doing this experiment is quite simple. You go out into a field of corn, about 10,000 plants. These are open pollinated varieties, lots of genetic variation. And uh, you look at the plants, you find those that have multiple air shoots. And so I've kind of indicated that with the little orange things. <coughs> And uh, you find them before they get a chance to extend the silks and before the pollen comes out. And what you do then is you detassel all the other plants so they can't contribute any pollen. So uh, the only pollen flying around is from those what we call prolific plants. And it's the only ears you're going to harvest off this thing are from prolific plants. Call that biperennial selection. 
You take that seed off those milk pouring plants that are produced this way, put it in a bag, plant it the next year, and do the same thing again. That's a cycle. We've been through this 33 years. Okay? So the issue is how many how many errors <coughs> do we have on a plant? Well, I just, uh, cycle one, you know, we had one to two air shoots. Uh, and I just, this is a picture of a plant out of cycle 23. And this, this plant has about 15 or 20 air shoots of, of plant. Now, what, what is noticeable about this plant is not that it's got the typical sort of architecture there. What it's done is, it now it looks like it has branches all over the place. And all those branches are capped by an ear in an extended way out. Now this was a little bit unexpected, but it's no longer unexpected now that we know what's happening. All up and down the corn plant are buds, little axillary buds that are repressed for the most part. And the only place where those buds aren't repressed are where the current ear is. And these buds have been repressed through the domestication act. I'll talk about that in a minute. So all we're doing here by asking for more issues is to say don't repress those buds and what you get is this thing on the side where actually it's producing lots of lateral branches that are nothing more than sort of a replication of the main stalk. We're going to come back to this because this is a very powerful means of morphological organization across plants and animals. So have these morphological repetitions that occur all the time. All those, all those branches are very similar in organization to the main stalk. The ancestor of maize is something called Teosinte. And it's off there on the left. It has, a, a, initially people could never understand how maize originated from Teosinte because it had such distinct morphology. And by the way, I want to point out something here. Here's the base of, a, of an ear, and you'll note that all the ear is is a very condensed lateral branch. It's fully formed, but it's very, very much condensed. All you have to do is extend it out and see what was apparent on the previous slide. So people had a long time uh, trouble trying to understand why Teosinti, or how Teosinti became corn. Teosinti exists in southern Mexico, Guatemala, and uh, based on genetic and other information we have, was, it, was, it, was the, the ancestor of maize, but nobody could actually figure out how that actually happened. Well, I'm not going to go into that at all, but let's just point out, I just want to point out that this domestication process, you want to kill some of the maize by, basically by humans harvesting seed off that plant for 5,000 years, produced the, the, the modern morphology. And what we've done in 23 years by this means of selection, and more intense selection, has actually gotten about two-thirds of the way back in its evolutionary history. And we're actually dealing with some of the same genes. A very simple process when you look at it genetically. The genes are pretty well understood now. And things can change very, very rapidly when you have simple genetic control. And I, I, given the fact that it's Donald's birthday, I do have to deal with, with, and I want to deal with, the true example, or the, the, the classic example of natural selection. I've been dealing with nat artificial selection up to this point. And this is the issue of Darwin's finches. Darwin, when he visited the Galapagos in the, in the 1830s, uh, did a lot of collecting. And um, he was collecting birds. He, did, he wasn't an ornithology in any sense. And then he didn't really think very much about the finches that he was, close, uh, he was collecting. In fact, he didn't even think a lot of them were finches. Um, he was basically making his judgment based on head characteristics and, and bill beak characteristics. <coughs> and uh, he sent this collection back to an ornithologist friend back in England and basically called his collection uh, blackbirds, finches, gross beaks, and, and things that he thought were completely separated from one another. They actually collected some of these under the islands and thought that they were isolated and all this sort of thing. Gould turned around and said, wait a minute, based on what he saw, that all of what he was looking at, at least most of the finches he was looking at, were all ground finches of one sort or the other, very closely related. And what all Darwin was doing was collecting a sort of gradation of natural variation. And 
Uh, so so, so uh, dramatic to Darwin, he actually thought he was dealing with completely different genera. So when Darwin actually realized that, then things started clicking in his mind, and he said, really, things have changed, that there were natural relations and things as important as beat size, and that really this may provide a pretty good example of what he's looking for in terms of small changes to the natural selection. Um, two people uh, that are well known now for actually carrying this out and actually demonstrate the truth of that conjecture are Peter and Rosemary Grant. Um, they've written a lot about this. They've been going to the Galapagos since 1973, spending about six months a year there, and measuring beak size, bill size in these birds, as well as the other vegetation that they feed on, and noting the, uh, the you know, drought, stress, and moisture levels, and all that sort of thing. And it's pretty well documented a couple of things. In general, uh, at least among uh, the ground finches, selection for large size occurs in dry years, droughts, primarily in, because of the vegetation that's available. They need the big beaks to get the large, hard seeds that are produced by the plants that predominate in dry years. And it goes the other way. Um, in wet years, smaller beaks uh, occur in wet uh, kind of uh, come about in, the, in wet years. The changes, you know, we're talking about a half millimeter or a millimeter in size uh, per year, not small or not large, but certainly enough to over time make huge amounts of difference. And, and more recently, they've actually got this down to actual genes that are involved with confirmation of beaks. Uh, they do gene expression uh, profiles uh, amongst these different species and pretty much come down to various dimensions of the beak are controlled by different genes. So we, we pretty much have that dialed in, so to speak, at this point. So selection works. Okay, that's the way I put it to my class when I go through all my selection examples. Darwin had a much better way of saying it. He said that the great power of this principle of selection is not hypothetical. There are thousands and thousands of examples of selection. This is exactly the way I described this. Now I want to conclude a little bit um, with some messages. Uh, they're coming from an interesting direction because how is the genome organized such that it responds so well to selection. And the uh, field of evolutionary computation, so the idea of trying to program artificial intelligence, is taking a close look at evolutionary biology and trying to engineer computer code that responds to selection. And I don't know a lot about this other than very interested in it, but they, you know, when you, when you try to predict weather, uh, you have millions and millions of lines of code, and I imagine it's very hard to try to make the code more efficient when you're dealing with millions and millions of lines. You know, you adjust this little algorithm here, that one right there, uh, and then back predict what the weather looks like with the uh, altered thing. But this seems terribly inefficient. Um, if you could actually model code in such a way that it works like the genome does, in other words, you produce variant code so you have a lot of different potential computer uh, programs that can predict that. You design it in such a way that you produce changes in that code randomly, perhaps. Well, let's just say that's a concept if you're going to be evolutionary about it. And then you design it also the different algorithms throughout that code can be randomly interchanged amongst them. And what you do is you set up a contest. You have 100 of these evolvable programs back predict the meteorological events and see which of those codes works the best. And then we combine them and introduce random computer mistakes and coding mistakes into that and see if you can actually improve the codes using this system of evolutionary computation. Now, of course, you have to design the computer programs in a very special way because computer programs are not routinely respond to random changes in the code. They, they, they won't work. So that's the, that's like another. How does how do evolutionary computer people design code to work this way? And they look at evolution for the answer. Um, I will say that they've been successful, um, at least to look, you know based on some of the things that they've come up with. And I think there are probably people in this room who know more about this than I do. 
The question is, how can we make random forces be creative? Okay, so I'm going to shift back. I, that's, I, that's kind of a question there. We're going to come back around to in a second. So just be patient. I'm going to go back to the you know, grass genomes and, and sort of come up with some of the observations, recent observations about the way the genome is organized. Genomes, as we now know, because of all the sequencing, are terribly, uh, they have a lot of conserved regions in them. This is a syntony diagram. You don't need to know anything about this other than the fact that what you see is uh, genomes of rice, maize, sorghum, sugarcane, foxtail, millet, rice. Uh, 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 I can't read what the other one is. And this is how they all align together when you put them around in a circle. And you find out that perhaps more than 90% of plant genes have close homologs within most other plant genomes. In other words, our, our species are not that different from one another if you look at the gene se uh, genome sequences. And this is kind of surprising. You think, uh, you know, uh, they are very different. And uh, we tend to think, or we used to think, that conserved regions were so important to the existence of that organism that, you know, it's just tailored to, to, to what that organism does. But what we find is conserved regions are across species general. And this is a little puzzle. Um, and I'll explain this comment in a minute. But based on this observation and others that I'll allude to in a second, um, it's beginning to look like a significant number of highly conserved developmental mechanisms are characterized by not being programmed for a particular specialized job and, more, and, and in some cases by profligate inefficiency. We have a highly conserved or at least homo, uh, uh, regions of the genome that are shared widely across the plant kingdom and profligate inefficiency in the way genes are being expressed and used. What do we mean by that? Uh, this, uh, by the way, I'm getting into a field called evolvability. You can go into this uh, in more detail if you like. Um, it's probably best shown in, to, to the biologist in, in um, John Carroll's recent book, Endless Forms, Most Beautiful. And he talks about four properties of genome organization or plant organization that allow this kind of inefficiency to actually be very productive. He calls them redundancy, modularity, multifunctionality, and flexibility. I'm going to deal with two of these because they're the easiest ones to deal with um, based on what I've said before. A lot of papers have been written on this, but let's talk about corn in particular. If you go back in the ancestry of corn, and we're talking about 60 million years ago, you see we had uh, corn's way over there on the right, and we have rice coming off. We have oat millets, we have sugarcane sorghum coming off next, and we have trichicum coming off next. And uh, during this whole sequence of events, there have been two whole genome sequence duplications. The genome is duplicated twice in maize. One occurring about 60 million years ago, and one about 60 to 25 million years ago. That means that you don't have one copy of the gene, you have four in the genome just because of these duplications. Furthermore, when through the sexual reproduction, you often have genes that end up being painfully duplicated due to mistakes in replication. So this is an addition to the, to the two rounds of double. And actually, as you look at it, one third of all maize genes are tandemly duplicated. So nearly 1% of maize genes, about 500, have nearly identical parallels um, within the genome. And this provides a reservoir of genetic variation upon which selection connect. I want to point out the main thing is that you have many, many copies of genes that are doing absolutely nothing. They're doing nothing more than collecting mutations. As long as one of those genes works, the rest can just fly on and flop on and do whatever they want. They can collect mutations. And you know it won't hurt the organism. If there's just one gene there, you get a mutation that's a bad one, and most mutations are bad, destroys the organism. Just like a random coding mistake in a computer code. So you have duplications, lots of them, and that is the stuff of evolution. It allows mutations to occur, most of them are bad, occasionally you get a good one, and it also allows specialization of genes. They can occur in particular tissue, 
or a particular kind of development and provide slightly different morphologies or, or other sorts of things to happen. That's what we mean by redundancy or duplication. The other thing that you see in the plant kingdom, and it's also true in the animal kingdom, is you see the plants are organized with multiple morphological modules. A leaf, stem, how, how do we call it? A leaf, node, internode, and ancillary bud. I showed you this before, but here's one, what we call a fiber, here's another one on top of it, here's one, here's one. The whole plant is piled with these little morphological modules. This is very effective too, for exactly the same reason. That it allows those modules to play around a little bit. Now that's being anthropomorphic. It allows changes to occur in those morphological modules. And if it just occurs at a certain point in time, it's not going to be the best state in the plant. Okay? So there's kind of a hierarchy. I mean, you look at this, there's a hierarchy of redundancy going on. You have basically the whole plant, the whole plant is repeating off the side, and then with those, within those plants, you have the modules. Okay? Very, very good ways of allowing evolution to take place. This is a trilobite. And this is another example in the animal kingdom of the same sort of thing. You have morphological, repeating morphological modules. And in fact, it's the same process occurring in animals. They've got it pretty well dialed in in terms of uh, how this is working uh, genetically in animals. And, and we have these things called Hox genes. And it turns out there are about 10 Hox genes that actually determine the fate and number of these morphological modules, the number and then also the differentiation uh, through development. There's 10, and the now trilobites were way back in the Cambrian. They're the base of the arthropods, which are the insects, the crabs, all those sorts of things. Um, those same 10 genes are in humans. Almost a dozen. But we have 39. We've had a, several duplication <coughs> events of those 10 genes. So you actually can model actually evolutionary history. This is just a graph of going from the trilobites, the ancient arthropods, to the land forms. And you actually see the same thing throughout the animal kingdom. Insects, dinosaurs, and certainly our vertebrae and other things are also examples of that same process. Pretty darn effective. And the last example I'd like to give here is just a, a, a sort of a, a comment about the Cambrian explosion. Uh, and this occurred about 550 million years ago. Prior to the Cambrian explosion, most life was in the unicellular. But something happened relatively quickly in evolutionary time, somewhere around 550 million years ago. All sorts of multicellular organisms came into existence. And granted, in evolutionary time, 20 million, 50 million years is, is, is short. It's a pretty darn long time, but still, it's, a, it's kind of hard to understand how this happened. And it's, it's accurate reason. But one of the things we have to understand is, may, are we seeing the same thing here? That if cells, single cells, somehow didn't completely separate during the, their division process, so you had clumps of cells that were staying together by some defect, and then you have this redundancy, this modular redundancy at the cellular level, allowing individual cells then to express perhaps a slightly different form of a gene that perhaps in some circumstances would aid the group. And it, again, it's a very powerful mechanism to allow differentiation by allowing this redundancy. Was that possibly the reason why we had this explosion of multicellular organisms? It's purely speculation. But it's the sort of speculation that people are dealing with now in the modern era of genetics. Very simple concepts started with Darwin and uh, continuing today. Yeah, the uh, code people, evolutionary code people would, would describe it this way. The function performed by vulnerable systems of complex code must be only imperfectly and in some cases even haphazardly related to the underlying coding sequence itself. You have to allow things to change. And most of those changes are going to be bad, so you can't have a one-to-one -one correspondence between change and the out outward apparent phenotype. A couple more quotes here before I end. 
Even if we had the complete DNA sequence of an organism and unlimited computational power, we could not compute an organism because an organism does not compute itself in its genes. That's one of the naturals of uh, Lewinton and Harvard. This is kind of the modern concept of the way we're organized. The organizations that are best suited for evolution are precisely those that are most ill-suited to the classical standards of scientific description. This is coming from the computer science scientists, and he's talking about sort of the engineering perspective, that we really can't constrain ourselves so tightly by trying to come up with a precise code to get to an endpoint if we want a volatile code. So I'm going to end this with, with Donald's concluding statement. Thus, from the war of nature, from famine and death, the most exalted object which we are capable of conceiving, namely the production of the higher animals, directly follows. There's Granger in this view of life with its several powers, having been originally breathed into a few forms or into one, and that whilst this planet has gone cycling on according to the fixed law of gravity, from so simple a beginning, endless forms, most beautiful and most wonderful, have been and are being evolved. This is a concluding paragraph in the first edition of the origin. It's a wonderful statement, and it contrasts somewhat to what I started out with, with the uh, horribly cool works of nature and Douglas Chapman and all that stuff. So he'd really come around. This is really a wonderful thing for me. In the second edition, and in subsequent editions, he inserted some very interesting words. Right in there after breathe, he put by the creator. So having been originally breathed by the creator, in, in, creator into a few forms, or into one. And this has been a subject of speculation for a long time. Did Darwin have some sort of awakening? No, he didn't. Darwin did not want the issue of the creator and his involvement here to get in the way of what he was talking about. He put it in there to say, okay, we can have a creator breathing the energy into this stuff. I wanted to talk about what happened after that point. He made that perfectly clear um, to his friends when he did it. And actually, he came to regret that statement. And so I'm going to end up with, with, the, with his quote as to why he did that, again, to his friend, Joseph Hooker. But I have long regretted that I have truckled to public opinion and used the term creation, by which I really meant appeared by some wholly unknown process. I think we owe an awful lot to go on. So, thank you.